We have well, Wake Forest this week. They have Hank Bachmeyer at quarterback, uh, transfer from Boise State. They run that slow mesh um, offense, which is unique in and of itself uh, and everything. You know, they they found ways to do things. And it's funny, asked about Wake Forest this week uh, in his Monday presser, Mario Cristobal said the first interview that he ever sat in on as an assistant coach for a GA position. I forget what school it was, but it was Dave Clawson. Um, so that was his, the beginning of him building his process of how he interviews people and builds a staff. Like, yeah, I forget where he said that he was, whatever the first big school, uh, I would think it was Rutgers. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, he's, I mean, known of Dave Clawson for a long time and everything respects him. And, you know, Clawson's done a really solid job at Wake Forest. I think that they're operating at near peak optimization. I don't think that you're going to get much more than what they get, you know, eight, you know, seven, eight, every now and then nine, if you have a, you know, a nine win team and get a bunch of breaks, you know, that turns into 11, like it did the one year or 10. Um, but solid coach, you know, they're a, a older team. That's a developmental program. They don't have, you know, plug and play Ruben Bain, you know, freshman, all Americans. They don't have those guys. They have guys who come in there, you know, strong academic school like Miami, but they're going to be there and develop physically over the course of time before they start having an impact, really. But, uh, yeah, you know, solid team. Um, they usually don't beat themselves, but they can – Bachmeyer have some turnover issues. And, uh, yeah, Miami just, again, needs to go out and do what they need to do. They're three score favorites, I think. It was open at 24. I've seen it's up to 25 and a half. Um, you know, look, it that's what it should be. So – you know, with an over under of 65, you're talking 45 20 ish, give or take, depending on what you bet, is what it should be for Miami. I mean, that's a, Miami's averaging 45 points per game. Um, you know, we had the not the Dr. Jekyll, but the Mr. Hyde performance on third downs on both sides of the ball against Georgia Tech. You would expect that to return to form i was gonna say regress to the mean but it's not it would be improvement back towards the standard performance that we've seen from the team over the course of the season um from miami on third downs especially uh and everything but again this is a team that likes to spread you out this is a team that likes to you know throw the ball and they've seen what other teams have done so you know expect to see some of those uh similar kinds of schemes uh you know being employed so yeah i think that miami will give up some points because uh, that's the thing that this defense does. Uh, but honestly, as long as Miami, and it, I mean, honestly, it should have been a win at Georgia Tech, even with as bad as things went. Like, you got inside there 43 times and scored a total of zero points. You can't have that, you know. Um, but yeah, as long as the defense holds to 24 or fewer points, I think that Miami should cruise. I saw Dave Clawson uh, coming off the field at halftime, or maybe it was a pregame hit uh, when they played a weeknight game just a couple of weeks ago. I think it was the Cal game. And uh, he, he, I'm going to put him in the same category. Bronco, Bronco Mendenhall comes to mind as I look at these guys and they're very balanced individuals, meaning you know that they care about and not discarding other coaches that nobody cares about their player. Like they care about the academics. They're trying to do the right thing. They're building a program and they almost seem like they're too nice to be a major college football coach. And it's like, how do you survive, buddy? Like I admire you, but man, you, you are like, you are getting into the batter's box with two strikes every week and you're doing it the right way. And I commend you. You got to be awfully smart and really good at what you do because you know, they've had a couple of rough years recently, but you mentioned mm -hmm. the ACC championship game they mm -hmm. reached just a few years ago. And they had a string of seasons before that where it was seven and five, eight and four, eight and four, seven and five, over and over and over. So they're they're beating a lot of the teams on their level and just losing to the Clemsons. And it's like that's that's pretty pretty remarkable. <laughs> I mean, it's honestly it's a different way you know that they've accomplished it but it's very analogous to paul johnson's time at georgia tech we have this specific scheme 
we have these academic constraints. We have, you know, and that, you know, uh, addresses the recruiting inequities. So we have to find a money ball kind of a way to, you know, look at the, you know, the, at the market and see, okay, who are undervalued players and what are things that we can do to exploit what other teams do in some measure and be very disciplined and things like that. And, and, but it's, if you look at it, it's very similar in a, you know, a different space, but very similar. So, yeah, I mean, he's, he's good at what he does and everything. Um, I don't think that this team is nearly as talented as Miami, but again, if you mess around and you miss tackles and you turn the ball over and you go, you know, you have your worst performance on third down offense and defense in the same game and fourth down, all of that at the same time, you can get beat like we saw with Georgia Tech. Hopefully, you know, they uh, address those issues. And as Falcon and TRX is saying, you know, Georgia Tech was bad. It was capital B-A-D bad. Uh, but 9-1 and one is huge and the sky is the limit. Yeah, I mean, I couldn't say it any better myself. Yeah, and I've got to admit, I probably know less about this Wake Forest team than I have any of their teams. I usually know, okay, they got these two running backs and this guy wide out. And of course, when Sam Hartman was there, he kind of gave a name to some of those wideouts because they were catching 75 passes and they had some decent players on the outside and so forth. But I haven't really looked at them and have not seen them play at all this year. But then mm -hmm. I'll watch the game against Miami or at least see part of that. And then they'll they'll be like one or two guys on both sides of the ball that they'll spotlight and you'll you'll determine they'll make a couple plays and you'll determine oh that guy's a really good player i never heard of him or oh i remember hearing his name in the off season or something yeah he's a really good player like why is he there <laughs> like what what happened that he landed there like did he yeah. develop that well or he just wanted to go to wake I mean, yeah, a little bit of both, but I mean, just a quick perusal. You know, you got Hank Bachmeyer at quarterback, 2,300 yards even through 10 games, uh, 14 touchdowns, nine interceptions. Uh, their lead running back is Demond Claiborne, 919 yards and 11 touchdowns, so 92 yards or 91.9 uh, yards per game um, on 19 or 18.9 carries. So 92 yards on 19 carries a game. Uh, Tate Carney is their lead backup at running back, and then they have Taylor Morin, 52 catches for 676, Horatio Fields, um, Donovan Green, both of those guys have 379, 374, and then Deuce Alexander, freshman, is 365 receiving. So they got four receivers with 350 yards or more. Um, and then they have another freshman, Micah Mays, with 183 yards, and then they throw it to the running back a little bit as well. So – that's just a quick thing. And then looking on defense, their leading tacklers are all, like you would expect, DBs and linebackers. Nick Anderson is their leading tackler with 105 from his, I think, safety position. Branson Combs and Dylan, Dylan Hazen, excuse me, 82 and 70 tackles. Evan Slocum with 60 and Donovan Patterson with 55. And in terms of sacks, they have – 18 for the year so 1.8 sacks per game um so not too too much pressure um and five tackles for loss uh on the uh per game 100 and, sorry yeah 54 for a loss of 208 um and everything so yeah you know they they you know that, that's what they have from a statistical standpoint so that's just kind of some of the high notes uh and everything if i look on the I should have had, well, I was looking at Miami, but uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, Wake Forest, they are 83rd in um, SP Plus ranking so far this year. They have our, doo -doo 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 -doo, well, where is the offense? I missed, I'm missing it. I'm missing it. Ooh, their defensive efficiency numbers are atrocious. And their offensive explosiveness of their offense are also atrocious. So they allow opposing offenses to be incredibly efficient. And while they have a marginal level of efficiency themselves, they have like next to no explosion on offense. Um, so, yeah, that kind of plays into exactly what uh, Miami wants to do and has built the profile of doing. Um, so, yeah, just go out there and. And win the game, fam. Just win the game. 
I only see one comp here, and that would be Cal in their last game. That's the weeknight game I just mentioned. They lost 46-36. Of course, Miami came back from 35-10 to beat Cal. That would be the one comp, which back in the old days in the ACC, you'd have three or four of those, five of those games um, yeah. that you could compare, but uh, it's so spread out now. So they were able to Win at NC State, not a great NC State team, not as good as they typically are. I think they're five and five, so they won that game. And I know this Virginia game, they scored two touchdowns like in the last five minutes to pull that. No, they lost that game. Virginia scored two touchdowns late to yeah. beat them. Is that their only? Oh, they beat Stanford. Th this tells you a lot right here. They beat Stanford by a field goal last week, and the week before they beat UConn by a field goal. Yeah, it's not a great football team. <laughs> right. So, I mean, reasonably, you could you should expect a, you know, three or four touchdown win for the Miami Hurricanes. But again, that's incumbent upon Miami going out, handling business, and executing. And everybody this week has talked about the fact that through the last two weeks, the things they focused on have been communication, alignment, and assignment. Because all of those systems broke down against Georgia Tech. <clears throat> you can see that there are players on the field trying to communicate ineffectually with each other. Henceforth, they were not aligned correctly, and if they were aligned correctly, they did not know or execute their assignments. And in a lot of instances, all three of those things bore themselves out to be true at the same time. Lack of communication, not properly aligned, and not doing whatever the assignment uh, for that player on that play was. So, yeah. Wise word says Cam Ward needs to call the best play to put Miami in the best position to win. You know, yeah. Um, also, sometimes he just needs to run the fucking play. Ah, there I go. <laughs> Cursing again. I'm sorry. Um, you know, and, and just like every, every swing cannot be a home run swing. That's how you strike out. Sometimes, you know, you need to choke up, be, you know, long through the zone, you know, and everything and just... That, you know, that that nice Tony Gwynn five and a half hole between shortstop and third base, line drive, two hopper in the left field, you, you know, just poetry in motion, right? Oh. Now, Tony Gwynn, an incredible athlete, by the way. I, I think he is still the all-time career assist leader at San Diego State basketball because he played basketball and got drafted as well. Like, he yo, Tony Gwynn, I, he you know, ended up rotund and like that. I get it. Yeah. but an incredible athlete, and he can hit the ball 425 feet when he wanted to. You put a batting practice fastball down the middle, middle in, and they, oh, I'm just going to get over on 2-0. and oh. Parking that. Go look. He hit hundreds of home runs. But you know what? Sometimes, and a lot, and he's a different athlete, and it's different, but like, yo, other way, inside out, hard line drive, boom. Maybe I'll pull it into the gap. I'll go shopping, things like that. But every single swing was not a home run swing. And Cam Ward needs to learn that. And again, if you look on the last play of what Miami's last offensive play at Georgia Tech, you had two check downs open. And he elected not to throw either of them, hunting the big play. But again, I reiterate, if you take that play, that check down to Elijah Royal, he gets six yards and gets out of bounds. That gives you the opportunity for the next play to be the home run play. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you have to discretion being the better part of valor. Look, I, I want it. I get it. it the highlights and blah, 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 blah. if it ain't there, maybe take what the defense gives you. And I think that there needs to be a measure of that going into those things, um, you know, and giving Miami the opportunity because there could be a highlight touchdown on any single play. So it stands then to reason that with more plays, you would have better impact. So I get it. Sometimes, yeah, hunt for the big play. If it's not there, check it down. We're going back to the line. Hey, Jacoby George, I saw you break open late for the touchdown that would have won that Georgia Tech game. Miami would still be undefeated at this point. I missed it. But I look, I took the eight yards. We got out of bounds. My bad. The next time that that happens on this drive, I got you, fam. Nothing wrong with that. But you just there he Cam Ward is 95% big play hunting and 5% check down. And it's funny because he's like, oh yeah, Mark Popin. The oh, I'm sorry, geez, wow, throwback. Mark <laughs> Fletcher, 
<laughs> and others, uh, you know, Damian Martinez, oh, they're great in the check down game. So why don't you throw the ball more in the check down game? If they're so great, because you've said it now. I didn't say it. I didn't lead you with that. Ask, okay, what about your receivers? That are there? This was weeks ago. He said, oh, yeah, they're great in the check down game. So throw them the ball. Let them check it down. You saw what Mark Fletcher did at Florida with a couple check downs where he almost scored, right? Give yourself more plays. And then when it hits, it'll be there. And like the, the rollouts to the left and things like that, that have been the Colby George touchdowns and whatnot, those have been across the 50. You're not always going to hit the touchdown pass from your own 18 yard line, my boy. So take a couple of the check downs, stay in the structure of the offense, which again, as we're going to continue to move through this season and into draft season, that is the thing that NFL people want to see. And I've had an opportunity to talk to several scouts who have come to games and they say, yeah, we want to see him play on time in structure. That's why I'm trying to highlight some of those throws that we see in games. Oh, from the right hash to the left sideline, that quick out on a line with, you know, you know, uh, the velocity and the placement and the touch and, you know, hitting these NFL throws where, no, you're not just running around and scrambling like you're Caleb Williams or um, Patrick Mahomes or something. They call a play and it's there and you take it in the structure of what's there. That's a key thing for him moving forward as well. So if you have the opportunity and ability to do that, please do that. And then when the situation is there to go big game hunting, let's go hunt.